Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm a neighbor from Fort Myers, and uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about my story coming from Puerto Rico, another whole tangible story of the ones we have been hearing about. I grew up in Puerto Rico, and please pray for Puerto Rico as, as they suffer the aftermath of this hurricane. And, and I grew up in a communist household. My father was founding member of the Puerto Rican Communist Party. He was there in 1959, in January of 1959, where they started the Communist Party. And uh, my father used to tell me that America was the enemy of the human race. And it was my sacred duty as a good person to destroy this country. And I believe him. He was my dad. I grew up in that kind of environment, listening to the never-ending speeches of Fidel Castro. I mean, seven hours of speeches. <laughs> and, and listening to his arrange against capitalism and Yankee imperialism. Uh, I never forget my mom one day crying and... and in the middle of the night, I probably was five years old, and there were always two men in front of our home, and she went to speak with them. And I was very afraid that she would never even return. Uh, many years later, I found out that there were FBI agents who were always checking on my father, and I hated them. And I dedicated my life to try to, to fight against this country. My mother was always crying. I always remember my father telling her, you know, I will give the life of these four children we have at home for revolution. And she will cry. We will come and console her. But deep inside of me, I wanted that kind of commitment to a cause. So I joined the party with him. Uh, I brought with me part of this FBI file of 50 years of communist activity three court cases for terrorism. My father was a real <laughs> soldier for, for Marxism. I probably have my own file somewhere <laughs> because I joined the party with him. At the same time, my mother was well, a, a humble Puerto Rican woman of the 1960s. Well, what are we? Whatever he says we are. We, she says we are communists. Okay, we are communists. Well, he, she used to sneak me with my, friend, my, my brothers to go on to mass with friends without my father knowing about it because he would not have allowed it, you know? Uh, religion is the opium of the people that keeps, think, keeps us thinking on heaven while the capitalists are having a good time here on earth, as he used to tell us. Uh, but, and in me grew this kind of double consciousness. On the one side, revolution, and on the other side, these ideas about God. So what was a good Catholic and communist boy to do? Well, eventually I grew up and joined the Jesuit order, of course. <laughs> I decided to become a Jesuit priest because they were all Marxists, and I thought I could have my cake and eat it too. You know, I could play religion and be a Marxist at the same time. And they were going to send me to Nicaragua, to Sandinista, Nicaragua to study philosophy, and I was excited about going there. I imagine this was the, the hub of revolution. This is the time of when liberation theology was spreading throughout Central America. The fire of revolution was burning, and I was going to be in the midst of all that, uh, those events. My father, who was a non-believer, was happy for me because he knew the Jesuits, and he knew uh, what I was going to do. I was going to be studying with the with the masters of liberation theology, Ignacio Yacuría, Juan Luis Segundo, Gustavo Gutierrez. These are the men who invented liberation theology. But it was never to happen. Uh, you probably, the younger ones here, don't remember, but seven Jesuits were murdered in El Salvador in 1986. And I was going to be living in the home where they were massacred. So. Out of concern for our safety, they decided not to send us to Nicaragua. And that's when I left seminary. You know, I, I did not want to be a priest. I wanted to be a revolutionary priest in Nicaragua fighting America. When that did not happen, I returned back home, frustrated, angry at the world, and finally decided to advance in my studies and come to America where I did not want to come. They wanted to send me to Fordham to study philosophy. I said, I'm not going there. I'm not going to the guts of the monster, as we used to call this country. 
uh, but I ended in the guts of the monster. And I landed at the University of Southern Mississippi, of all places. <laughs> But at the same time, I always say that that's when, when my lungs were filled with the breath of freedom, right there in the deep south. Because for the first time in my life, I had the opportunity to challenge the safe assumptions of my ideology. You know, ideologies are like a pair of glasses that is so comfortable. It's a prism through which you look at reality. And, and you don't want to get rid of that comfortable pair of glasses. It's so painful to just surrender that kind of ideology. And that speaks to what Mr. Crouch was talking about. We are so accustomed to certain things in life that we don't realize that there may be other way of looking at reality. So it took, it's a long sh story. I don't have the opportunity now to talk about all of what happened, but I learned certain things right there in the deep south. And the, one of the things I learned was that my life mattered, that every human person is made in the image and likeness of God with the moral capacity of self-realization. We have the double capacity of reason and will. We can know the truth and we can do the good. And there lies our dignity. That happened to me as a Marxist because in Marxism, my life had meaning I had dignity if I was a faithful drop in the great wave of revolution. If I was a faithful drop and I did my duty as a revolutionary, my life had, had meaning. Apart from that wave, my life had absolutely no meaning. I was to be suffused into that great wave of revolution. But America told me, no, you as an individual human person have meaning and value. And you know what happens? We have forgotten that as Americans. What happened to me was I come here at a great personal cost because my father at the end was not even in speaking terms with me. He died a communist, he died a Marxist. But before he died, he called me and I went back to home in Isabella, Puerto Rico and he told me, Ismael, I don't even accept what you are embracing. I don't even understand it but you better fight for it. You better fight for it because, you know, this is the testimony that if he fought for what he believed. And sometimes we just talk about faith and we play religion. Mm. And we have made our churches to be wawas of faith. <laughs> That's what he was talking about. You know, we have made our, uh, we have depersonalized our encounter with the poor. We have forgotten about the uniqueness of every human life made in the image and likeness of God. So as I come to America, I see you guys embracing what I was surrendering because that's what we treat, how the way how we treat the poor. I, I came to America and began to do ministry in the black community right here in Fort Myers and I saw the same assumptions of Marxism alive and well in the way we treat the poor. We box people into these meaningless labels of race and ethnicity and, 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 and money and class, you know? The poor, the rich, the blacks and the whites. And we forgot about the human person in front of us. The human person has been lost in a great and expansive wave that is this thick, one inch thick. That is totally meaningless. <laughs> but simply that the human person has been lost in an expansive but thin wave of race and class. We have forgotten about the human person. That, isn't that what we do? The poor come to our churches in my church. Christmas is coming, and what we do? We put a Christmas tree in the back, has a piece of paper with a name, the next Sunday you bring the bike, you don't know that family. You don't want to know that family. You just want to ease your conscience, feel good about yourself. And then we have this small bureaucracy in the church. They dirty their hands with the poor. They take the bike, they bring it to them. And we go home justified. And we call that Christian compassion. When in reality, it's nothing but really is easing our conscience and 
trying to feel good about ourselves. We have made, make, made the poor to be our pets because you know how it is with our pets. We, you put the bowl of food there and the, po the, 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 poor, the, the pet comes every day for his food and you pat him in the head, make you feel good, and you repeat it again and again and again. And that's what we have become. You know, we have become poverty managers. And I'm gonna, con I don't know, four minutes. I, I want to talk to you about what happened to me. I quit my, my ministry job one day that I was looking at the long lines of people who were coming to our ministry for us to pay their bills and to give them food. And I began to see the children of those I had been giving food for a long time coming themselves for food. And I realized that I was part of the problem. I was part of the cycle of dependency that really de depersonalized the poor. I was, you know, a, a manager in my own wow <laughs> business that we call church. So I quit my business, I quit my, in my ministry without even knowing what to do. We started the Freedom and Virtue Institute because we are convinced that we need to build our ministries on a foundation of principles. That's what we don't have. We feel good about things and we feel sorry for people. We go from the heart to the muscle. We feel sorry for people, we give them stuff. And we give them more stuff and more stuff. And under the weight of the free stuff, we dump at people lies their dignity, waiting to be awakened. So we started the Freedom and Virtue Institute. We do training for churches and nonprofits. We teach them the seven principles of effective compassion. You know, Christians, we have forgotten our own History. We were taking care of the poor before the government came with the welfare state. We were taking care of the poor. And we forgot the systems and the principles that were the foundation of that exercise. And we are bringing them back. So we train churches and nonprofits on those principles so they can measure what they are doing against those principles and begin to make changes in the things that they do. Very briefly, we did this uh, uh, training uh, a few years ago with a ministry in Joplin, Missouri. And uh, uh, what they do today is that they have a thrift store. They used to give just clothing away for the poor for free. Now every piece of garment has a tag with hours of work if you want this piece of clothing. And they created shops right there in the ministry. And the poor come to work. And you have a CEO sitting side by side, a homeless man working together. And at the end of the day, that person can say, you know, I can shop in this thrift because I earned it. And that's the only way that we are going to rescue ourselves from this mistaken anthropology. We have mistaken what is the human person. And we also have what we call model projects that show in practice that what we teach in our training is not just words, you know? Sometimes people tell you, oh, Ismael, that sounds good, but it cannot be done. Yes, we are doing it ourselves through our ministry. So we don't just talk to you about it, we show you. One of our model projects we would love to bring to uh, Miami is called the Self-Reliance Club. I went a few years ago to a massive distribution of school supplies, and what did I see? Well a sea of black and brown kids getting a free cheap school supplies from a small cadre of white people. <laughs> and I say, there's something wrong here. Number one, why is always us in the receiving end? You know, I'm tired of being in the receiving end. I want to be in the giving end. But to be in the giving end, we have to create wealth. But why don't we help the kids do exactly that? So we decided, why don't we make them work for it? So now we are in 25 public schools. The kids work throughout the, in the schools in entrepreneurial initiatives. We teach them economics. They earn money through their work. And at the end of the year, we do this, school, this uh, field trip to a bank where we hand them their earnings at the door. They go open their own savings account so they can use their own earnings to buy their school supplies. 
instead of having someone give it to them. So that is the kind of simple, practical projects that really show, showcase the dignity of the human person. Thank you for your, your attention. Do you have any questions? Yes. So how do you go about setting up those types of programs and trying to get the kids involved? How do you, how do you get started and then say, for example, I wanted to go in eighth grade, that mm. same kind of um, work yes. type of program, but then you teach yes. different things that are oh. kind of down the path and do that. So we, we have a model. We call it the, the human flourishing model that has five principles. One is practicality, simplicity, meaning, measurability, and replicability. So the, the, the project has to be simple. We, we bureaucratize everything, you know? We, have, we create these programs where they pour, enter this door and all their needs are met and they get out of the other door. So they, they are becoming what? Passive recipients of magnanimity instead of becoming active participants in lives built by themselves. That's what we want, you know? To, to, to treat people as full human beings. It's very simple. I used to go knock on the door of the principal of a school, offer the project to the principal. We don't introduce any new activities into the schools. We simply change the meaning of existing activities to make them entrepreneurial. So there's no extra work for the school at all. For example, your arts classes are places where wealth is created every day and the kids don't realize that they are creating wealth. They do a picture, you put a frame, and you sell that, and that is, that's wealth right there. So we basically adopted this, the class. The class, the art class became our club. The kids are doing exactly what they were doing before. Now they are earning, and they are learning. And at the end of the year, they earn money, enough money, to buy what they need to meet their educational needs. It, most of the schools have gardens already, no? May, that's really popular now. We adopt the garden. The kids are, are now doing exactly what they were doing before. You know what? The teachers became my staff. So I don't have to start just paying a lot of salaries to a bureaucracy in my organization. The teachers become our staff, and they love it because they tell me, Ismael, about time that these kids do something for what they receive. Because, you know, I'm a suffering teacher. I have to pay for the school supplies of my kids. No one helps me because I'm in the middle. You know, I'm not poor enough, and I don't, I don't make enough. So I have to be. So they are happy to help us. So we are spreading with the self-reliance clubs in a very simple way. We can start a club in five minutes. Just meeting with a teacher, convincing one teacher to become our sponsor, you adopt an existing activity within the school, and you have the club going. So it's simple, that, and that is the stuff of life, you know? Freedom comes in the simplicity of everyday life. Change happens in a systemic, organic way, and that is the kind of change that is sustainable. What happens in many organizations is that they keep become micro-bureaucracies, and they I become so important and so necessary that then eventually I am more interested in raising a lot of money to keep the, the organization going. Many nonprofits have become invested in the very problem that they say they are trying to fix. You know, if my organization is about giving food away, I need more hungry mouths. I don't need less. So I am invested in the problem, even though I'm trying to solve the problem. And that is not the way to help the poor. Yes. Well, I brought uh, examples of our training manual for churches. You, you can take them at home. It's a training manual that where we go. For, here now, for free. $15, that's my book. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, but the training manual, please take the training manual and ex examine bringing this uh, training to your church. And if you want the self-reliance clubs, we have a how-to manual from A to Z where you can start your own clubs 
become, we help you, uh, and eventually you don't need us. You don't need us, you can do it yourself, and that is the way to do this kind of job. Okay. Any question? Oh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can do it on yourself. We can accompany you, and uh, and you can adopt that as your project. We have the how-to manual. We come and help you. We even help you a little bit financially in the beginning to make it starting. So we are we are here to change the way we look at poverty. We should not be necessary in this exercise. We are here to support your work, and it's your responsibility too. You know, I don't live in Miami. It's your community, your responsibility. <laughs> We're here to support the work that you, that you do. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it.